God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Would you please join with me in prayer? Loving God, we give you thanks for the beauty of this day, for your steadfastness and your love for us. We come to you today just as we are, with our joys, with our sorrows, with our hopes, and with our fears. Trusting you, our God, to hold these and to hold us, to see us through, to give us a vision of a day beyond this one, and also a hope for this day and always. Be with us now as we gather to worship, we pray. It is in your name we do lift up these prayers. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. We're glad that you all are worshiping with us. We're glad to have you be a part of this experience. Instead of passing the friendship registers, we encourage you to please uh, mark that you are visiting, that you are participating in the comment section or in the chat box with our YouTube video. We have a few announcements that we'd like to share with you. Coming up on May 17th, Sunday, May 17th from 1 to 3, Isaiah 58 will have a virtual drop-off site here at St. Mark. Uh, there are a number of needed items. Those are listed out in the church newsletter and other uh, ways of communication. If you have any questions about that, please contact the church office, but we will be hosting them a week from Sunday on the 17th. Also, there's information about the Red Cross Blood Drive. We had the ability to host this a little while ago, and it was a, a great success. And so they had asked that they could use Gleason Hall once again. Uh, so we're going to be opening that up, I believe, on the 21st and the 22nd from 10 to 4. It is important that you register through the American Red Cross through their website because they're discouraging anyone to come up as a walk-in. So if you have the ability to give blood and would like to donate, uh, please sign up for that through the American Red Cross's website. Uh, finally, uh, a note about a member, about a uh, staff member of our congregation. Uh, Martha, Marcia Medley is not able to be with us today. She sustained some injuries uh, this past week, and so please keep her in your prayers, and we hope to have her back in worship in the very near future. Now, as we continue in our worship, I invite you to please join with me in our call to worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Lord, hear my voice. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. Lord, hear my voice. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. Lord, hear our voices. I invite you to please rise as you are able as we sing our first hymn this Sunday morning. It's hymn 792, There is a Bomb in Gilead. i 
believes in Christ will not be put to shame. Confident in this promise, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, you have called us to live in sincere faith and to suffer for the gospel. We confess we do not come before you with a clear conscience. Our faith is clouded by sin and uncertainty. We shrink from your call to live sacrificially on behalf of others. Too quickly we seek our own ease and comfort first. We confess that in our lives and in the church, we rely on our power rather than yours. Forgive us, we pray, for we are fractured and fearful disciples. Take away from us a spirit of cowardice and restore to us the spirit of power rightly used, of love unconditionally offered, and of self-discipline gracefully lived. In new mercy, forgive us and increase our faith, that we may be your faithful servants. In Christ's name we pray. Let us silently confess to God. Sisters and brothers, once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Because we are forgiven, we can be at peace. Let us now share that peace, the peace of Christ, with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. With the account, with the possible exception of the account of Jesus' crucifixion, this is probably the toughest chapter in the story. But just like the account of Jesus' death, we have to pay attention to what's going on in this story as well and in ours. To ignore suffering, to ignore death, and only to celebrate triumph and resurrection 
is to miss the fullness of this story and the fullness of ours. Now in today's story, the northern kingdom is no more. The ten tribes are now cast to the four winds. They are blown away never to be whole again. The southern kingdom of Judah, they have been warned just like Israel. They have been warned over and over and over again. A handful of good kings have come to the throne and some have enacted important change. They have gone back to the law. But progress is lost again and again as subsequent monarchs promote idol worship and forsake God's ways. Judah's story is the story of taking one step forward and then sliding two steps back until they have slid so far that they are just about to hit rock bottom in their relationship with the Lord. Now the Scripture tells us God is slow to anger. But this has been too much. It's been 400 years more bad than good. And God allows an outside power, the Babylonians, to be lifted up, to lay siege to Jerusalem, to conquer the territory, to transplant, to take away the best and the brightest and move them back to Babylon and to even burn down the temple, the symbol of God's dwelling place among humans, a symbol of identity for the people of Judah in Jerusalem. Now we know that there have been prophets, the prophets who have warned about the need to return back to God. We've talked quite a bit a couple weeks ago about Elijah, and this, this last week we talked about Isaiah. This week we're talking about Jeremiah. He has a powerful call story as well. I encourage you to look it up in Jeremiah chapter 1. The other prophets foretold the upcoming disaster, but Jeremiah is living in the middle of it. He is known as the weeping prophet because of the destruction that is going on all around him. The physical pain of the people, the emotional and the spiritual harm of the loss of everything they ever knew. They are abandoned, they are rejected, and at last they are subjugated. Judah is no more. The only thing left to do is cry. Now Jeremiah is credited obviously with with his own book in the Bible, but he's also credited with writing the book of Lamentations. There is some historical and scholarly debate and the doubt of his authorship there, but regardless, the person who was writing these words was personally familiar with these events. We're going to hear from Lamentations chapter 1, and and in it, the city is described as a personification of a widow who looks out on the destruction, looks out on everything that is lost, looks out on the consequences of sin. It is a tough chapter to hear, but with open ears and a soft heart, let us all listen. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations. She has become, she that was a princess among the provinces, has become a vassal. (coughs) She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her young girls grieve, and her lot is bitter. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has made her suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From daughter Zion has departed all her majesty. Her princes have become like stags that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembers, 
in the days of her affliction and wandering, all the precious things that were hers in days of old, when her people fell into the hands of the foe, and there was no one to help her. The foe looked on, mocking over her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously, so she has become a mockery. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She turned herself, her face away, with groans. Her uncleanliness was in her skirts. She took no thought of her future. Her downfall was appalling, with none to comfort her. O Lord, look at my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. Enemies have stretched out their hands over all her precious things. She has even seen the nations invade her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation. All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, and see how worthless I have become. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire. It went deep into my bones. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint all day long. My transgressions were bound into a yoke by the hand that they were fashioned together. They weigh on my neck, sapping my strength. The Lord handed me over to those whom I cannot withstand. The Lord has rejected all my warriors in the midst of me. He proclaimed a time against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter Judah. For these things I weep. For these things my eyes flow with tears. For a comforter is far from me, one to revive my courage. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is no one to comfort her. The Lord has commanded against Jacob that his neighbors should become his foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear, hear all you peoples and behold my suffering. My young women and young men have gone into captivity I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priest and my elders perished in the city while seeking food to revive their strength. See, O Lord, how distressed I am. For my stomach churns, my heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. In the street the sword bereaves, in the house it is like death. They heard how I was groaning, with no one to comfort me. All my enemies heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. Bring on the day you have announced, and let them be as I am. Let all their evil doing come before you, and deal with them as you have dealt with me, because of all my transgressions. For my groans are many, and my heart is faint. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. I was never forced to leave home. When I left after high school, I went to college, and I lived with two of my brothers. The first time I was really on my own was the year after I graduated, and I worked for Oscar Mayer. And out of 380 days of working for Oscar Mayer, 365 of them were spent in hotel rooms. Now, when I was younger, I used to look forward to staying in a hotel. My kids looked forward to staying in a hotel. But the novelty of staying in a hotel quickly wore off as day after day was more of the same. 
We tried to explore every city that we visited as much as possible, but because of time and because of circumstance, many times we simply had to eat in the hotel or get a drink at the hotel. An old friend, Ron Sammons from college and from my Oscar Mayer days, had a special name for hotel bars. Ron called them lonesome towns. It's probably the best description I've ever heard for them. It's an old Ricky Nelson song. But they were in different cities, but each city had, it felt, the same place. It had the same air of desperation. Some people were tired, some people were sad, some people were hustling, but nobody ever seemed to have any kind of joy or any kind of happiness. They shared a drink they called loneliness. All of them, it seemed, wanted to be someplace else with someone else doing something else. I don't know if you've felt this before, or if you're feeling it right now, this feeling of being displaced and dissatisfied, because Lonesome Town is not just a Ricky Nelson song. It's not just a hotel bar. It's, it's what Thoreau said, that most men live lives of quiet desperation. And loneliness travels. We can go on, but the loneliness will stay with us. Now in the Scriptures, we have the book of Psalms. And there are different types of Psalms. There are Psalms of praise and wisdom. the are royal Psalms and Thanksgiving songs and Psalms of lament. There is only one theme in the book of Lamentations, and it's pain. Most chapters in Lamentations are in the style of the acrostic poems. You might have remembered doing acrostic poems when you were in elementary school. Each line begins with the next letter of the alphabet. And that's why I felt in, important to read the entire first chapter to you, the entire poem. Now, scholars have debated for centuries why this is. It's not a literary accident. The medium, in this case, the style of the writing is the message. And I wonder, maybe, just maybe, that the writer wants something orderly in the midst of so much disorder in the world. If we can't make sense of the world, we will do our best to create structure within it where we can. And that's the thing about chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 of the book of Lamentations, but specifically chapter 1, it does not provide a nice ending. It doesn't offer a nice and neat conclusion. It's 22 verses. It's not 22 minutes of a 1980s sitcom. It's not a very special episode where every major issue is resolved by the time the credits begin to roll. No, Lamentations is like our life. Untold suffering at times for an undetermined amount of time. Life is not nearly as tidy as the Keaton or the Seaver or the Brady family. It's not for the people in Jerusalem in today's story. It's not for ourselves in our current day, in our current struggle. Pain is a disorder. We are not created for it. And yet to live is to experience suffering. It is part of being fully human. As C.S. Lewis writes, To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything in your heart will certainly be wrong and possibly broken. To try to avoid suffering, or more specifically today, to try to deny the suffering that we are going into, is to reject an essential element of what it means to be human, to be part of humanity. Ignoring or repressing these feelings does not make the problems disappear. Because suffering, like mushrooms, it grows in the dark. But in those dank and dreary places, it can metastasize and permanently harm our well-being. Now, I realize there are situations and there are times in our lives where the suffering, what brought it about, is beyond our control. But if we look back on our lives, other times, and so many times, there are the natural consequences of our actions. We want to lay the blame, and for a while we do. We want to deflect or we want to blame we want to put that fault at someone else's feet until things finally come crashing down on us and we finally acknowledge it's our own darn fault 
Emily Dickinson famously wrote, I could not stop for death, so he kindly stopped for me. If we won't stop for suffering, friends, suffering will stop us. Carly Simon once saying, I haven't got time for the pain. Well, the truth is, the pain is going to make time for us. But maybe the good news, maybe the only good news we hear in this first chapter is that we are never supposed to suffer in silence. There's always space to cry out to God and to cry out to one another. Last week I mentioned that the leaders I respect the most are the ones who are most honest, who respect me enough to tell me the truth, even hard truths. And this week I think what Scripture is telling us is that we have to be honest, even when that truth is so difficult to bear. And it requires introspection, it requires patience, it requires courage. To be honest with ourselves is to listen to our lives, to listen to our souls, to go to the deepest bedrock of our humanity and to strip off all those things that are not life and to commune with the holy. And the author of Lamentations begins Lamentations 1. How empty is the city that was once so filled with people. These words speak truer now in my life than they ever have before. There was a time early on, a couple of months ago, when the coronavirus quarantine was something novel. It was something new. During the early days of the shutdown, when it was new, it was scary, sure, but more than that, it wasn't yet a mundane routine. It was, at the time, fascinating to see Times Square empty of people or the 405 freeway in California without cars and without smog. To see the birds filling the clean sky, the sea life, the empty waters. But we have, are not just visiting Lonely Town. We are living in Lonesome Town right now. What do we do when the pain is no longer novel or new? What do we do when every recipe has been tried, every show watched, every puzzle finished? What do we do when the silence is deafening, the situation like the struggle with grief has no definite and final end? What do we do when we have to confront our grief? Now, Other parts of Scripture, specifically 2 Kings, deals with the facts of the case. Why did this happen? How did this happen? God's perspective on what's going on is detailed in the words of the prophet Jeremiah in his book. But Lamentations, Lamentations is something entirely different. It isn't exactly about the facts. It is about our human response, our feelings, our emotions dealing with this suffering, dealing with shattered expectations and with wrecked lives. Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, tells us there is a time and a season for everything under heaven. A time to live and a time to die, a time of war and a time of peace, a time to laugh and a time to cry. The Bible gives us warrant. The Bible allows us to cry. To cry even out to God. This is that season. I often talk about the need to cry with, when I'm going through and, and working through counseling sessions. And I say we have to pay attention to our tears. Are these productive tears? Are these tears that just recycle themselves? Are they tears that let go and let out these things so they don't overwhelm the cisterns of our souls. To cry out is to protest and to say our protest, to draw attention to our pain, even God's attention to what we are going through. To cry out is to process these emotions, to not suffer in silence, to work through our grief, hopefully with other people who have gone through something similar and can comfort and can encourage us and perhaps show us the map of how to get out. 
to cry out is to protest, to process, and it is to voice at last our confusion. We don't know what is going on in the world. And the good news is our God is big enough for our confusion, for our sadness, even for our anger. Lamentation gives a sacred dignity to our pain. But before we can be honest with God, we have to be honest with ourselves. Honest about those things that that would bring us to our knees, those broken marriages, those prodigal children, those difficult diagnoses, the loss of jobs and of expectation. We would not go to a mechanic and say there's nothing wrong with the vehicle that keeps making that strange clacking and knocking noise. We would not go to a doctor and lie about the pain in our joints. We, why do we go to God and why do we go to one another and pretend everything is okay? Especially when we are broken. Especially when the world around us is so broken. Why are we so scared to share this pain with God and with one another? The author of Lamentations could not sugarcoat it if he tried. He is living in the rubble. He cannot shout all is well in the midst of the riot that is going on. The city's shame is uncovered and the world sees the nakedness and the shames of its misdeeds. Frederick Buechner over and over in his writings tells us, listen to your life. Listen to your life. See it for the fathomless mystery it is. In the boredom of it, in the pain of it, no less than in the excitement and the gladness. Touch and taste and smell your way to the holy and hidden heart of it. Because in the last analysis, all moments are key moments. And life itself is grace. Listen to your life. Listen to the world. When the city is empty, when it is lonesome town, when we are all displaced even as we remain at home. Because, friends, if we want restoration, we must speak the pain of our grief. If we want overflowing grace, we have to be honest about the depth of our sin. If we want light to break through, at last we must acknowledge that we sit in the darkness. There is healing out there. There is healing out there. I don't know when, I don't know where, but I trust that God holds that and that God is not done with us yet. There is healing and wholeness around the corner if we honestly seek it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. It is now the time in our worship service where we stand together, if able, and recite together an affirmation of faith. This morning we will be using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, the Lord is our portion. Therefore, have hope as you bring your gifts to God. Let us pray. Lord, your steadfast love never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. Use these gifts, we pray, that through them your compassion may be known. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures Son and Holy 
We now come to a time of prayer, acknowledging that we have different joys, we have different concerns, we have different things that are weighing upon our hearts. And so during this time, I'm going to pray again from Lamentations chapter 1. But may you pray also in your own heart, in your own place, in your own lives. May this prayer be you not only talking to God, but also listening to your life and listening for God's response and for God's healing and comforting word. Will you please pray with me? Present Lord, how lonely sits the city. Alley rays, a road without games or even mischief. What was once great among the nations, holding backyard baseball at neighborhood parties, has become a vassal, a faded photograph. She weeps bitterly in the night, left alone to the distant sound of one more screen door slam. She has no one to comfort her, knowing another has left for good. They have become her enemies through death and desertion. Judah has gone into exile, along with the words hope, and future. She finds no resting place, for danger lies with the abandoned. Her pursuers have all overtaken her, symbolized by the tall weeds in her lawn. The roads to Zion mourn, sidewalks split and bulge, the priests groan, churches are closed up. Young girls grieve, throwing rocks at abandoned window panes. Her foes have become the masters. Depression and victimhood moved in because the Lord made her suffer. A badge of punishment she wears in search of balance. Her children have all gone away to a place where someday they will pay the ransom. From daughter Zion has departed all her majesty. No one turns their head, much less thinks to listen. Like stags that find no pasture, authorities find no subjects. They fled without strength, waiting to die. Still, we ask, Lord, that you be present. Still, we ask in these lonesome streets and these lonesome spirits that you speak again, that you move again. We pray, Lord, when there is less of us, less things to distract us, that there might be more of you, more of your comfort, but also, Lord, more of your vision for a world. And so we pray, God, not just for those who have been affected during this pandemic, but those who were affected by injustice long before this outbreak hit. For those who know what it means to live in lonesome and desolate places. For those whose tears have been their food. For those who are, murder, who are mourning the loss of loved ones murdered. For those who are crying out for justice and feel as if there is no one who hears. For those whose neighborhoods do not have healthy food and healthy options for those who have no work, for those who have lost hope, and for those who need healing in our emotions, in our bodies, but in our spirits, Lord, as well. We pray, Lord, just like the author of Lamentations, that you be present with us. And now in this time of silence, as we listen to our hearts as we lift up our prayers quietly to you. We pray that you be near. And we pray, Lord, that you be with the prayers that we have spoken aloud the prayers that you alone know, the prayers, God, that 
are all around us, just being just waiting to be lifted up to you. And that you hear us as a people, as we pray together, even as we are separate. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy, thy will, will be, be done, done on, on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day, day our, our daily bread, bread and, forgive and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to please rise as you are able for our final hymn this morning. Hymn number 821, My Life Flows On. now go out into a world that is filled with so much loneliness. Go out into a world that is empty. Go out into a world that is struggling. And may you know that God is with you. May it so fill you up that you cannot be a blessing to one another. And in those times of suffering, in those times of doubt, in those times of grief, may you feel the Lord is with you. The Lord hears you. May we be honest with ourselves. May we be honest with God and know the Lord will never leave us. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may it be with you this day, this life, and always. Amen.